What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back with a box office breakdown for Saturday, February 3rd. And obviously, these numbers are estimates. They'll be fine-tuned over the course of today and tomorrow. But I love doing box office breakdowns on this channel. But there has to be box office to discuss, or in the case of this weekend, the lack thereof. Because it looks like Argyle is coming in below expectations or below projections. And it actually might be just a full-blown Bomb, but as we see in this article over on Deadline by Anthony D'Alessandro, uh, the story is more complex when you're dealing with a tech giant versus a traditional media company. And one of the most fascinating things for me about the film industry, going back to the uh, you know like the pioneers, it's a technological medium, so it's always changing. And because the technology is always changing, within the business is always changing, and the art is always changing. And when you have companies like Apple, which are worth roughly three trillion dollars, the question is. How do they measure success? What do, they, what do they want from the film biz? Like, why are they even experimenting in the film industry doing things like Killers of the Flower Moon and Napoleon and now Argyle? Because they're all extremely expensive movies, and all three of them have not necessarily done that well in terms of box office. But with, like, with Killers, you get it. It's like, all right, 10 Oscar nominations or 11, whatever it ended up getting. I think it was 10. Like, is it worth spending $250 million to get 10 Oscar nominations? Maybe, I mean, if like, if these films are just vanity projects, then that would be totally worth it. But Argyle's not a vanity project. When you're talking about a movie like Argyle, obviously, prestige is not the goal. Like, you know, awards is not the goal. The goal is entertainment, pop culture, ticket sales, downloads, all that stuff. So let's head over to Deadline, where the expert Anthony D'Alessandro has his article, Apple Original Films Argyle with a C-plus cinema score and near $17 million opening isn't cutting it at Weekend Box Office Saturday Update. And let's just dive right in, and I'll periodically interrupt the article with a few observations of my own. While the theatrical marketplace is starving for big movies, post-strike Apple Original Films' $200 million pickup of Matthew Vaughn's Argyle isn't cutting it with a $16.5 million opening, C-plus cinema score, and three stars on Comscore slash Screen Engine's post-track. At the end of the day, this multi-supporting actor and actress ensemble isn't provoking people to drive in their cars to cinemas. Yeah, yeah, that's where tracking saw it. But we need to finally come clear and say it. Ready? Despite Apple being a $2.87 trillion company and able to shell out for these $200 million, or in some cases $150 million budgeted movies like Napoleon and Killers of the Flower Moon, make no mistake. Dollar for dollar on the motion picture P&L sheet, these are losses, and in some cases, they don't have the other ancillaries that other movies do, a la foreign TV. In the cases of Napoleon and Killers of the Flower Moon, there's a small transactional home entertainment window. Furthermore, if Apple isn't going to get hurt on this 35% Rotten Tomatoes critical movie, then Universal is in its distribution deal. Read on. How does Apple get away with not being dinged? It's what I'm often asked by several industry sources when it comes to the tech company playing in the fields of box office. On one hand, there's something to be thankful for on behalf of Exhibition that the streamer is embracing wide theatrical. Then again, the overall marketplace is at $59 million this weekend for all titles, down 20 27% from a year ago. We certainly don't want Apple to abandon theatrical. However, how long can this reign of $150 million to $200 million undergrossing movies continue? That's the question. Will Apple ultimately belt tighten after the string of uber expensive movies? Who makes an R-rated $200 million movie? Because at the end of the day, every corporation wants to profit. But let me pause for my first interruption where I just want to add that Argyle is technically a PG-13 movie. While I get his uh, condemnation of making $200 million R-rated movies that ultimately end up selling no tickets, at least in the case of Argyle, there's at least the possibility of quote-unquote four-quadrant appeal. But my attitude is if you're making a Matthew Vaughn film, just let Matthew Vaughn be Matthew Vaughn and try to make a four-quadrant R-rated movie. But also, yeah, the idea of Apple buying this movie for $200 million... Yeah, it's going to be hard not to uh, have their ego bruised, but the question is, like, does Apple want to make any money on these movies? Obviously, when it comes to headlines, it's helpful if you have um, if you have big box office and big ticket sales, and obviously it helps out on the platforms. But I would love to hear what Apple's goals are with these movies, because if it's just to have extra stuff on Apple TV Plus that looks good and has movie stars and big prestigious filmmakers, well, then mission accomplished. Then they don't they don't really even need to put these suckers in theaters, but 
I haven't heard anybody kind of articulate the overall goal. Like with Netflix, obviously, their overall goal is they want as many subscribers as humanly possible. But Apple is never going to live or die based on the subscribers to Apple TV Plus. And so, are they happy with what like with what they've achieved? What are their long term goals? I have no idea. But full disclosure, I am an Apple shareholder. I'm hoping Apple will do well on this front, but obviously with all their crazy VR headsets and that sort of thing, that is where the future is going to be for this giant tech company. But in that our homegrown American entertainment industry, aka Hollywood, is facing so many headwinds right now and such an uphill battle on so many fronts, I, I guarantee you that every single agent or exec in the, in the city wants Apple to continue investing in these movies. So it's like people are trying to be critical of these movies being like, you know, at least commercial failures. But on the other hand, they want Apple to continue to invest. And so it's a strange relationship right now because obviously in the absence of big tech, like in the absence of Amazon, in the absence of Netflix, in the absence of Apple, Hollywood, which is already shrinking, would be considerably smaller. So yeah, it's just a, it's a crazy era in which we live where things are just changing so quickly. But let's get back to the article where Anthony says, the defense has been that these movies, i.e. Argyle, Killers of the Flower Moon, and Napoleon are brand plays for the service. Trinkets to drive global subs to Apple TV+. Plus. One film finance source told me that despite these movies being textbook bombs to Apple, their advertising costs. Witness the 10 Oscar nominations and 200 accolades per Apple boss Tim Cook for Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon and the anecdotal claim that the movie is the most popular movie across streaming platforms, despite the fact that it hasn't appeared in the Nielsen streaming rankings yet. Movies spurring Apple consumers to buy Apple products. Because I think that the products were selling themselves just fine before this content spending came along. Cook boasted recently that Apple services, the division that includes Apple TV Plus, is up 11% to $23 billion in the latest quarter, with Apple TV Plus subscriptions over a billion. And let me just pause to interrupt again. While Argyle might be a high-profile failure, Shows like Masters of the Air are definitely, I would say, probably where the future is for this platform, where you have something that like looks prestigious, feels prestigious, but is much more, I guess, streamer friendly. Because I think people who love the streaming platforms and people who love movies, they don't necessarily always overlap. And I live in my own little cinephile movie nerd bubble where like people who really love movies, they go to the theater and they love physical media. They love, you know, Vinegar Syndrome and buying Blu-rays and that sort of thing. And they obviously will watch movies on the streaming platforms, but I guess it's not their go-to because if you want quality, the theatrical experience or like 4K Blu-rays and that sort of thing, that's quality. Streaming isn't necessarily quality. And also diehard movie freaks usually like to kind of curate what they're watching. And sometimes you go to Netflix, like your favorite movie is not necessarily going to be available there. Like whatever they're going to, they're going to be pushing whatever their new hot show is. Also, another thing to keep in mind when it comes to Apple and Apple TV Plus is that last year, Ted Lasso was the most watched streaming show. I think Netflix had either seven or eight of the top 10, but the number one show in streaming was Ted Lasso. And I, I didn't even like the last season of Ted Lasso, but that show remains insanely popular. But getting back to the article, streamers such as Apple and Amazon who are playing in the theatrical space realized they needed to eventize their movies and reportedly more than profit are looking at other diagnostics as benchmarks of achievement, i.e. subscriber churn on the streaming site and how a movie translates into sales on the site, which is specific to Amazon. And let me just pause to interrupt one more time, but I find this whole new landscape to be absolutely fascinating where Apple and Amazon could spend so much money on the theatrical distribution of a movie. Basically, just to build awareness and they're just looking at it as a giant marketing campaign where you get cast and crew interviews at screenings like when I saw it in IMAX on Monday friggin uh, Bryce Dallas Howard and Henry Cavill and Sam Rockwell and director Matthew Vaughn they all showed up to plug and promote and do a little q and I mean that stuff does have value even if the movie overall is a mixed bag, to put it kindly. When I uh, posted my review on Monday, I talked about how I had a lot of problems, but there also were a lot of scenes that I really enjoyed. I'm a Matthew Vaughn fanatic. I love his style. I love his approach. But goddamn, it seems like uh, they quite literally... I, I, we're going to have to invent a new expression for jumping the shark because it's no longer going to qualify because... I guess this is a spoiler, but if you haven't seen the movie. But there's an action scene toward the end involving oil and kind of... Um, ice skates that are put together on the spot with knives that leads to one of the longest and most ridiculous action scenes that human beings have ever conceived of. And it seems like most people, when they see that scene, are just like, you know what, 
fuck this movie. This movie's ridiculous. We're like, we're done here. And, and people have a lot of other grievances and a lot of other, other complaints about the movie. I think the movie has other action sequences that are fucking glorious, and it's got some great scenes. I think if you're a Matthew Vaughn fan and love his work, it's definitely worth seeing. But his movies like Kick-Ass and Kingsman the Secret Service and uh, Lair Cake are much stronger. X-Men First Class. I mean, he's got, um, he's got some good ones. This movie just is... Anyway, it's a, it's a flawed film, and now people are just uh, turning up their noses toward it and uh, ripping, ripping it a new one. But as Anthony says in the article, but to say that these big tech congloms like Apple and Amazon, 1.78 trillion, are Teflon to losses is further from the truth. Amazon just laid off hundreds in its prime video and MGM divisions. Remember that Jason Ropel and Ted Hope administration and Amazon Movies Division? Their mandate was to make taste making awards worthy fair, just like Apple's, though it's significantly smaller budgets. And they did with such Amazon two time Oscar winners like Manchester by the Sea. Then there was the $80 million period movie, The Aeronauts, starring Felicity Jones and Eddie Redmayne, Jesus Christ. I can't even remember that movie. What the hell is The Aeronauts, which was made and intended for IMAX, but got short thrifted to a truncated short window theatrical release and pivot to Prime Video. At the end of the day, it was decided that the administration's output wasn't profitable or sticky enough for the brand. The point is, don't tell me tech companies don't look at bottom lines. As far as Universal, I hear it's a distribution deal in the sense that they get around an 8% fee of the box office. Chances are Uni isn't going to collect that. I hear Universal is on the hook for 50% of this $80 million marketing campaign, which has Vaughn's heavy fingerprints on it, and that the studio collects back what it's owed in marketing from the box office before it collects a distribution fee. All these Apple distribution deals work differently. In certain cases, some studios get a guaranteed distribution fee, even if the movie buckles at the box office. Yeah, for people who don't know, Apple used Paramount for Killers of the Flower Moon. They used Sony for Napoleon, and they use Universal for Argyle. And I suspect that they're experimenting with different models and different studios and different distribution fees to see what works best. I've heard some people argue that Apple should just buy their own distribution company and distribute the movies uh, with a uh, first hand or uh, do, just do it personally. But I imagine that they suspect or that they're deferring to the expertise of other studios that have much more experience. Like why buy your own distribution company if you can just like outsource it by paying another company to do it? But I think that's going to be um, a very interesting angle to pay attention to in the, uh, the months and years to come. Like who is Apple's dance partner on this front moving forward? But back to the article for Vaughn, that's the lowest cinema score of his career to date, arguably. He's gonna be fine. His Mar financed Argyle, then sold it to Apple for 200 million. The filmmaker self-finances and then sells his movie, which has been his practice with the Kingsman movies, the first two films acquired by 20th Century Fox for respectively 100 million plus a piece. Yeah, I don't think Matthew Vaughn necessarily gets the credit he deserves for be, for basically being one of the most successful independent filmmakers out there where he goes out and self-finances these giant movies and then sells them to uh, to the big studios. I mean, that's a huge risk. Like, what if you make a Kingsman movie for like $100 million and then nobody wants it? But obviously, Apple wanted Argyle and uh, they're probably now suffering from a little buyer's remorse. But um, here's a little more detail from the article. Mostly guy leaning here, 52% to females, 48%. I think that's a slight exaggeration. You, you could say it's a partially guy leaning here, 52 to 48, but that's basically a 50-50 split. Mean over 25 at 40% were the majority who bought tickets and gave Argyle a 73% grade. Women over 25 at 38% followed and graded the PG-13 action movie at 78%. Interesting. Women rated it a little higher. Diversity demos were 53% Caucasian, 20% Latino and Hispanic, 12% Black, and 10% Asian. IMAX and PLFs are repping 42% of Argyle's weekend so far, with the movie playing in the West, Mountain, South, and South Central. AMC, Lincoln Square, and NYC is the highest grossing cinema in the nation through Friday, with close to 50K. I actually saw the movie at the AMC Lincoln Square. It is the third largest IMAX screen in America. But let's wrap up this video with a quick glance at the overall top 10. Uh, Fathom Events' fourth season of The Chosen is in the number seven spot after a 1.7 million Friday on its way to 3.5 million opening at 2,248 theaters. And I'm, I'm unfamiliar with The Chosen, but uh, I am familiar with a lot of the other movies in this chart. So as I said before, I love doing uh, box office reports. But there has to be some box office to discuss to, to justify doing a video because if you look at this, uh, this chart, so many of these movies are the exact same movies that have been in the top 10 chart for months at this point. We have Wonka at number three still. I mean, that's bananas. And also, I should mention that Wonka's made $201 million. Like That's a movie where I walked out of it during the opening credits. But high five to uh, you know a movie which 
somehow managed to pull $200 million out of its ass in spite of being a musical. And people in general, like they don't like musicals, <laughs> but, but people keep making them. But Beekeeper hanging in there at number two. It's crazy. Beekeeper came out weeks ago, and here it is, you know, still number two in the country. That's just absolutely astonishing. How many? Weeks? It's week four. That is bananas. That just shows how thin the offerings are that a movie where I, f- I found the final product to be mixed at best, but it just shows how Jason Statham and David Ayer, they still have their fans. Migration hanging in there, number four. I did not see Migration. I did not see the musical remake of Mean Girls, which is still hanging in there at number five. Anyone but you. I mean, this movie's been out now for seven fucking weeks, and it's still in the number number six slot. It just shows Sidney Sweeney and uh, Glenn Howell or Powell or whatever the hell his name is. They have their fans. And I heard somewhere recently that Anyone But You is the highest grossing R-rated comedy in like five years. So Sydney Sweeney, yeah, she has arrived. I mean, anyone that's been following shows like um, Euphoria or The White Lotus has been a fan of hers for many years now, but she might be one of those rare actresses that can actually generate ticket sales in the theater. But I'm thrilled to see American Fiction still in the top 10. It's made a total of $14.9 million in eight weeks. I mean, that is a small, super-duper, indie kind of niche movie but it is well worth watching and i got a few oscar noms and speaking of oscar noms poor things has climbed back up to number nine at one point poor things had slipped down to like 11 or 12 but i think all the golden globes for that movie and also all the oscar nominations are definitely helping where people are curious like will emma stone win oscar number two or will it be lily gladstone from uh, killers of the flower moon i I suspect Lily will get like the political vote or the narrative vote, but in terms of just a pure arts and crafts and entertainment, I'm rooting for Emma Stone for Poor Things. I absolutely fucking love Poor Things. Found it to be very imaginative, very erotic, and very entertaining. And I'm just uh, very happy to see that after nine weeks, that super niche movie, which which obviously is not designed to appeal to kind of like four quadrant, like family friendly uh, attitudes and that sort of thing, that it can make 28 million. It's not as successful as The Favorite by uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, but it's doing just fine. And rounding out the top 10, we have Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, which has managed to make $120 million domestically. And obviously, yeah, the first one made well over a billion worldwide. But at a minimum, at least it can claim or it can boast that it crossed the, uh, the 100 million mark. What's crazy now, though, is how these giant superhero movies, at the end of their run, seven weeks in, have a box office total that you would expect would be generated in the opening weekend. And I don't know if 2024 is going to reverse the downward trend of the superhero genre or not because we do have some stuff to be excited about. Like we've got Deadpool 3, which I think could easily cross a billion with all the uh, X-Men cameos and that sort of thing. We've got Joker 2 or Fala la 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 la. It's got some French title. The first Joker did cross a billion and the second one could easily cross a billion. So those could be two of the biggest movies of the year. And the boys season four has will will probably have its fans. So that I mean that's three superhero products to be excited about in 2024. But we've also got like Madam Web and Craven the Hunter and Venom Three. And I think all three of those movies could be embarrassing failures. But just to circle back to Argyle, which almost does feel like a superhero movie in many ways. It's like I feel like it's too cartoony to be a serious spy movie, but it's not super heroic enough to be like a superhero movie, and I said that in my review, how it might kind of die in that little gray zone in between those two worlds, but the reality is the movie, at least for its opening weekend, is a goddamn bomb, or at least it's a goddamn bomb measured by traditional standards. If Disney had released Argyle, people would be, you know, like, you know, like, beheading Disney in public, you know, being hang, drawn, and quartered, like, people would be tap dancing on the grave of Disney, but obviously Disney has a very different business model. Disney does not sell computers, and they do not sell phones. But they do have their theme parks, which the th- seems like the theme parks are the thing that are keeping Disney alive. But it's just interesting seeing how all these different companies now, you have to use different units of measurement to try to figure out, are they succeeding relative to the goals of the people that are paying for the content? I think when it comes to Matthew Vaughn, the idea of going out and making a movie independently and then selling it for $200 million to an- another tech company, that'll probably never happen again unless you know his next Kingsman project, whatever, whatever it might be, is a raging success. But long story short, we live in very interesting times, and part of what makes movies or discussing movies so fascinating, going back to 1895 when they first came out up to the present day, 
It's where art and technology and commerce all kind of crash together. And sometimes technology gets neglected and sometimes the commerce gets neglected. Sometimes the art gets neglected. And sometimes you get that perfect home run where new technology and commercial imperatives and artistic vision all come together with like, you know, complete and total runaway success. I feel like a movie like Oppenheimer is a great example of that where they're using IMAX technology and they're using the best of filmmaking technique and craft, and they're still generating ticket sales and awards. And yeah, sadly, Argyle's not going to replicate the success of uh, of uh, Oppenheimer, but I'm sure uh, uh, Apple will be looking for an Oppenheimer success moving forward. And uh, Christopher Nolan, he has not announced his next project, nor has he announced who he's making it with. I'm sure Universal is going to back up a dump truck of money and say, please give us your next movie. We like making money. We like winning awards. But what if... What if Apple said to Christopher Nolan, we'll give you $400 million and you can do whatever you want? Uh, that would be exciting. And Apple could afford it. <laughs> if I were Christopher Nolan, I would do it. But that's pure speculation at this point. But I think I've said enough at this point. I'll definitely be back for more box office reports over the course of the month. We have Lisa Frankenstein. We have uh, Drive Away Dolls. We have Madam Web, and then in a few, sh few short weeks, we have Dune Part 2. And I feel like when Dune Part 2 comes out, that's when these box office breakdowns will get much more interesting. But thank you so much for sticking with me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell. But I hope everybody has a great weekend. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.